namaste and in la quête. And by now, I'm sure you know the meanings of those two phrases. I'm Zen Benefiel, still the host of One World, the New World over the last six months. And I've assembled a bunch of clips for the end of year project, if you will, to kind of give you a smattering of what we've talked about over the years, the conversations that matter, and even some as an apocalyptic notion, discovering, uncovering, and moving forward together in a new way, possibly even a new living awareness. Now, as we move in, as we move into next year, I truly hope that you'll be inspired with new ways of seeing the world, of seeing yourself, and of interacting with others to create a better world for us all. If you'd like to reach out to me, please do so. I'm open for conversation at any time or pretty much any time. And I thank you again for watching. Have an awesome new year. Namaste and in la catch. How might others be able to reflect on what's happening in front of them and see it in a different way? Yeah. Well, I, I think of COVID the destroyer, COVID the illuminator, and COVID the accelerator. Um, I like that. You know, and there's that three again. Yep. And um, so it's, I mean, I think coming, coming out, if, if we want to describe it that way, it's, it's really important as you look at uh, other people, as you connect with other people to, um, it's kind of like we've been hunkered down with a hurricane going on, and now the hurricane is is passing, mm -hmm. and and so you can look at other people n not fearfully, but understanding that that actually you have a new bond, right? Uh, a new shared experience. Plus, we've discovered that all kinds of things that that used to be said is oh that could never happen. Um, and so that actually opens us up to all kinds of possibilities of, of what could yeah. happen. Yeah, um, if, the, if these things were possible, and, the, and like you say, the accelerator, there's been a lot of really good stuff happen. Yeah. And you and I talking here yeah. now is yeah. a result of that. There are many groups that meet online, uh, mm -hmm. the virtual reality, and there's this, it seems like a magnet that, that's been created to bring folks like you and I together in different mm -hmm. ways to share what we've learned in a more global perspective rather than just uh, local or, or even regional. Yeah. We do need to do the harmony w with nature. We, we have a lot to accomplish at a very practical level in terms of harmony with nature. But my sense is that we, uh, you know, we aren't going to do that without more harmony with others. And that's going to be very much uh, dependent upon harmony within. So, uh, but the sure. good news is that harmony within is progressing, as well as harmony with others, is progressing in many, many people at uh, a, a historically rapid clip. Um, so, I think that we're going to we're going to find in in this decade of the twenties that there will be lots of things where the pundits and the journalists would say, well, we never saw that coming or we could never have imagined. We weren't paying attention. Exactly. Uh, so, so I think that, you know, the, so I don't want to get too much into, into predicting, but I, I want to say that the underlying strategy is that the only way we're going to get to a bright future is by having people who can, in, who not only envision it, but work toward the dominant society, the the first world, right, yeah. hasn't totally infected their world yes. with ideas and, and processes. That even though we're trying now with the destruction of the rainforest and trying to get oil and, and cattle and all that yeah. kind of stuff, these are just practices that um, you know. If you think about Mother Earth, it, they're abhorrent. Yeah, right? I have a theory. Uh, that I, I write about in the book, and I've got a slideshow that summarizes it, uh, that describes the eras of humanity and how we have followed these universal design principles of life, but mm -hmm. as a species. And that 
in, in the hunter-gatherer era and in hunter-gatherer societies, there's a consciousness of wholeness. And that's one of the fertile conditions that we have to cultivate sure. for any living system to thrive, that there's right. enough coherence and convergence at the level of the whole system. And then in the agricultural era, we honed in on the consciousness of relationship, right? We can be in relationship with the land and with the animals and uh, recognize the seasons. And both of these are fundamentally indigenous ways of, of being with the world. And right. then in the modern era, starting in ancient Greece, and it kind of fell away during the dark ages, but reemerged in the Renaissance and, and came back with a vengeance in the industrial era. And now it, it was a consciousness of separation, of divergence rather than convergence. And this is also part of, of life's universal design principles, that there are distinct parts. They're not completely, they're not fully separate, but there is distinction. Mm -hmm. Right, they're, they're contiguous, right? And right. so we we move through this, and there's a planetary civilization, I'll, I'll term it in that frame, because it mm -hmm. takes thousands of years, right? And mm -hmm. we go through these phases. Yeah. And like you're saying, you know, we're, we're coming out of the industrial phase, we're in, in, into the technology stage, which includes both physical and psycho-spiritual mm -hmm. technologies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so we're learning how to blend those uh, right. and be a little more effective. And, you know, because the existing systems are right. there. We have the mechanisms yeah. to do everything that we need. We just don't have the proper leadership and, and, uh, yeah. and thinking right. in them yet. So another word for blending is integration. And, and, and just one more thought about that era of divergence, mm -hmm. separation. I, I, my hope is that in um, uh, focusing on the experiment of what happens when we really dial that consciousness up to the hilt, as white Europeans have in their experience of the world, um, there has been some benefit and we've also proven how much harm that causes. And so um, it's... It, it, it gives me some hope that we haven't been only a virus on the planet, that there has been some value in, in both proving that there's, there's some benefit and also proving the harm so that we can together as humanity move into an era of integration, right. of wholeness and relationship and divergence and, and separateness and into an age of thrivability. So we are active co-creators of the social reality, but none of us can single-handedly um, keep this reality in place or transform it, right? right. It is We're an act of co-creation. And also by designers, like if, if somebody is saying like, oh my God, like uh, what do you guys think of yourselves as change agents or, or designers of systems? Like, who are you? Who the hell are you, right? And it's like, yeah, you are a co-designer of a system and, and, and I'm a co-designer of our social realities and everybody, we're just, most of the time, we're not aware of that because as Manuel likes to say, we cannot give up this job. This is, we are designers by nature. We're in it. Let's admit it. And let's just do something about it. Let's be careful what we design together, right? But at the same time, it's not a one person job. It's no. a collective job. And that's what I mean. Like you either can watch your own action and try to make assessments of your actions, or you can make assessments and sense what, what the, where the collective is going. And there is a relationship. What you do matters for the collective and what the collective oh, does matters for you, but you can never determine a cause and effect relationship between the collective evolution and your actions. What I find is, is that taking that to the, the next level is that, Understanding your skill set, your intention, uh, you're looking for a place to fit in. And, and, you know, it's like you're a thread in the tapestry. You're just looking to, to find where your entrance point is, right? And then the tapestry takes over from there because you're part of it. And your specific skill set, intelligence, understanding, uh, capability, talent, uh, all of those kinds of things fit in that perfectly once you see, once you begin to engage it, because you're you're all in, 
right? There, there's no leaving part of you behind to see how things work, right? <laughs> you, you've got to commit. And when you commit, everything else comes together around that. And everything else, including other people, places, things, and you're working on uh, while well, simultaneously, like Robert Gilman was saying, you know, you work on you're working on this harmony of self, others, or within self, others, and nature, right? Mm -hmm. And and that's mm -hmm. this new regenerative aspect that that we're beginning to look at, which is a more holistic picture, and then how we can design these uh, these new systems, and and it may just be redesign of the existing systems with just a little tweak here and there. Because they they are working, you know. Even in the material world, everything's being delivered, or pretty much, uh, you know, those systems are in place. They may not work to capacity or, or uh, as effective as they can. But that's this next layer, right? Mm -hmm. Where we're thinking about it differently, and, and we're looking at things at, at the same things with different eyes. So I I kind of th call it the thoughtmosphere, right? Where I there's a, yeah. there's this thing of circular thinking, right? Where you're looking at the same. Um, middle section from different perspectives. Well, as Mansi was saying even today, that um, there's this spherical view where you've got multiple places that you can see it from, and it's not necessarily a, a you know, woo-woo thing, it's a dimensionally uh, specific type of thing through the electromagnetic spectrum because we're not separate from it either. It's all energy, it's all vibration. So we just don't consider those things because we've just, been with this, um, I don't want to say two-dimensional, but three-dimensional model that we don't understand the greater aspects of, of what we can do as co-creators and that we're designed to be To be very honest, way. my journey has been of not having permission uh, for so long. And it almost feels like <clears throat> my journey has been about experiencing extreme powerlessness so that I could experience the contrast of true power. And at the same time, the, the extreme of needing permission to even breathe to having permission to thrive and not right. just permission, but like being able to make that available for others. And so what I think that what you're naming, I, I feel like I've lived both sides of that in some way. You can't appreciate the heights if you don't experience the doubts. Right, right. I mean, we are, you know, the, even the phrase that you use that we are cosmic consciousness uh, condensed into form, there is a polarity even in that statement of form and cosmic consciousness. And so that, that polarity, that duality is like what we've chosen to come into and play. And, right. um, it, it and when you step into it, it becomes one. Right, right, right. right. You know, and, and even science now. Right, right. absolutely. 99% space, you know, what's in between the proton, electron, and neutron, which aren't really solid anymore, they're just, you know, vibrating strings, but it's the space, right? And so that consciousness is there for us to enjoy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and, I, and I feel that, you know, in some ways I, you know, with the people around me, my family, um, the people I grew up with and grew up around, there is an element of how can we play with this other, the bigger, the all. I, I tend to call it the all sometimes. Yeah. How do I play with that without, um, without necessarily it being labeled as something? Um, exactly. Because when, when we start labeling, we limit right right how can it just be the normal of of this is just who we are and and that's i think partly why i call myself the mindset weaver which is about weaving that mindset which doesn't see this right. with the mindset that sees it with each other and and because there must be some wisdom even in those who don't see it in that way right. what is the nugget there and how do i weave those two together and I don't think I figured out how to do it, but I'm on the journey. But you so. mentioned earlier that it, in order to create this conceptual model, the the internal perspective of the creator needs to be well anchored in something. Now, where is that? You know, is that a, a place where there's a, um, where you're creating this idea, 
or does it emerge with the questions that are asked to find it? So there is a key question. I'm sure there's probably a combination. There's a combination, but if, if you wanted to, uh, if what we've experienced in our work um, over the last decade or so, what we've come to find is that we very much agree with Simon Sinek's idea that people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And so the key question is why? And when you start to ask that question of entrepreneurs and business leaders, it's personally, um, they often discover that they've, they've become rather unrooted from a, a personal purpose um, because our culture tends to push people in business towards uh, making uh, money. And that's been, you know, a big shift um, right. just as a little bit adjustments of to our lives that we don't necessarily resonate with and yet right. find almost imperatives to do. So it, it creates a disconnect. I mean, we've, we've in, in much of our culture, we have compartmentalize the the spiritual with a big s or small s yeah. to be you know what you do uh in Sounds a period of time how doesn't it yeah, yeah absolutely so it, it's it, we've partitioned it to be something we do on one day a week or at certain periods of the day um and um we've forgotten that the spiritual's alive in all of us all the time yeah um and um and the so, distinction too also is you know in this work that we do there, there's the old adage that don't oh, leave work at work, home at home, and, and they're separate work, lives. Work life, work they're life really aren't. That, that's right. I, I had a lovely experience uh, coming back from a conference, and I was sitting on a bus going back to one of the main locations, and there was the keynote speaker uh, who had, I just heard was on the on the bus with me, and I said I really enjoyed his talk, and I said where are you off to? And he said oh I'm off to New York, and I said business or pleasure, and he said there's a difference. Right. And I think that encapsulates it very nicely. Absolutely. So the the um, uh, so so once you've got people over the idea that they do in fact have a personal why, they do have in fact something that drives them individually. Then the question is, once the collective comes together to create an organisation, because an organisation is is a socially co-created thing, um, you've got to figure out what the why of the organisation is based on the why of all the people, and that actually brings the possibility that there could be a spiritual. Uh, dimension to the purpose of organizations right and now I, in this new thoughtmosphere that, that's being mm -hmm. created right there's obviously going to be some uncomfortability in that because it's new mm -hmm. it's an unknown you're stepping into something what do you find to be the the reticence uh, uh, that you have to work through in order to accomplish that so I think we're only in the very early days of figuring that out, to be perfectly okay. honest with you. Um, what we what we have found is this word flourishing turns out to be very useful because uh, people can put on it a very, very wide range of interpretations. Sure. And, and so um, when you suggest to somebody that they make the purpose of their business enabling the possibility for flourishing, um, some people will take that in a deeply spiritual way. Um, other people will take that in an almost purely economic way mm -hmm. and n neither is uh, and, and anywhere between those two and so well, and in fact that that term ends up being a world bridger right absolutely these, these different layers of, of how we think about the world and how we interact with it and that just you know kind of and brings it all yes, together you have to have a sense of humor doing this stuff oh, Absolutely. You know, if you can't laugh at yourself and, and laugh at what's going on, then you can't really deal with things effectively because you're too attached to the outcome yeah. um, or, or what you want to, you know, and, and it has, these things have a mind of their own. All you have to do is show up, be present and assist and allow the process to take place with the best intent possible. So, and that leads me back to the questions I wanted to ask the, the theme that you found or what theme did you find uh, first of all in the women's council you know that you've got this diversity of backgrounds and religions and things it came together for a common reason or, or purpose or intent um, what evidence did you find was at the core of that where everybody could gather around and feel comfortable with It did grow in terms of participation and audience. Mm -hmm. uh, that was part of the evidence of knowing that I was going in the direction that was needed. Mm -hmm. 
um, some of it was that uh, people contacted me to speak to the group. We always had some speakers. Uh, or those who I contacted were definitely in agreement, including the mayor, uh, the chief of police, mm -hmm. the deans of the colleges. They understood what was needed as we were growing into a much more diverse society, into a global village. Absolutely. Uh, and they supported everything I did, showed up, spoke, um, state senators uh, gave me uh, testimonials. It was a fascinating process. And for somebody who had, uh, in the very original place, just intended to have a nice tea party, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> in your in your observations, though, I, I, I understand the, the the support, which is really great and, and uh, absolutely necessary, and and proof that you're of uh, the value of what you were doing. I want to look at more. You know, what were your observations on a, on a more empathic level, if you will, or observational level of the common thread that was that ran throughout everyone in, in your conversations was there something that seemed to be that um, maybe unspoken unfulfilled expectation or, or even an unspoken um, sense that they had that maybe not have particularly been articulated but you had the sense that it was there because these are the kinds of things that we've avoided yes. talking about right for too long and, and it, what it's really what brings us together is to be vulnerable and express our deepest feelings and thoughts, which makes sense. Yes, exactly. So there were some specific women in the group that I resonated to very strongly. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I probably didn't look at it as consciously as this, uh, but I knew that each one of them was there for a reason. And I wanted to have a discussion around that reason. So, for example, one of my best friends was involved in healthcare in the city and had part of it being in terms of equity in healthcare. Hmm. Not that the language was used back in the day, but that was the sense of it. And so I created for the Women's Council rather than the usual brown bag lunch, an entire conference where people were able to sit around tables and brainstorm. They the table with two different dictionaries and they speak from their own dictionary, thinking that the other person understands what's in it. And so the, you know, the whole adage of you got to slow down to go fast, right? You have to kind of pull yourself back and say, wait a minute, I need to understand this person before I know that they're going to understand me because I need to know that the, the language that they use, the kind yes. of terms that they're familiar with, and then how I can respond so that they actually hear me instead of trying to push my ideas in the way that I think and assume that they're going to be thinking the same way. Right? We all think we think the same. Right? That's never <laughs> yeah. one of my years of business travel, and you, we used to get the cultural training before you go to Korea or sure. China or somewhere different, even, even going to the United Kingdom. I had training on how to deal with the British differently, and it's, it's both respectful, but it also is something that very, a lot of people don't think about. No. Uh, I, I knew another gentleman that uh, I eventually brought in for uh, interpersonal skills training at, at the same aerospace company. Um, he mentioned to me that, you know, in the eighties, when American businesses went into Europe and, and foreign countries and, uh, and tried to instill their way of doing business without investigating it and getting to know the culture beforehand, 80% of them failed. Mm. And so the, that's when that whole, you know, something, something, take a look. Something so fundamental, and yet it's overlooked quite frequently. I'm so, it's a shame. Some of that gives us that brash American reputation, particularly around the world, where, you know, we don't have to do those kind of things. Well, we do have to do those kind of things, frankly. We do, and that's the core. The, you have to establish the relationship. You have to understand 
or at least uh, this is what's come to the awareness of what is now in order to be effective in whatever we do, it's a relationship building. It doesn't matter what the um, product or, or widget or whatever service is, it's people yeah. that do it all. And so there's this innate um, perspective, I think, that we all have of, you know, like my opening in my catch, I'm another you. When, when you come at life with that perspective and, and in self-development, this, you know, you're taught at, at some point that, hey, you know, the person that you're having an issue with is just a reflection of what you don't like in yourself, right? So <laughs> that kind of stuff. Um, but it's true it, for the most part. And well, back to years ago, remember, back, I think it was back during Reagan's days as a president, where, or maybe earlier, where uh, people said, it's the economy, stupid. Well moving forward it's the relationship in in the context that we're talking today when all else fails it's the relationship right and then we're all in relationships on the ocean of emotion seeking wow. safe harbor i'm going to steal that one please <laughs> that's very good um, very. well you know there's these little catchphrases that we can use that we discover along the way, you know, some of the stuff just pops out of our mouth and, and we don't even realize it until after we hear ourselves thinking, we're like, wow, that was cool. I need to write that one down. Um, but these are the way the, that we share this new living awareness with others in a simple, understandable way. Because it's not complex, even in complexity and, and all the complexity studies and, you know, business uh, canvases and things around that um in that complexity it still boils down to the individual relationships and, and what and, and how the skill sets can be coordinated to work um collaboratively and synergistically i agree with that something i skipped over that i should point out because i i often skip over this or forget to say you know i talk about we're blessed and we got the freedom and we can do a lot of things now we're unique uh, we're big, we've got a lot of tentacles, but I keep using the word blessed and I do that for a reason. Everything we do is for good, not for for profit. You will never right. see, you will never see marketing, you'll never see advertisements, you'll never see any promotions, uh, monetary promotions on our website. And But that, that gives us the ability, particularly in today's world, to not turn to an advertising board or a board of directors to say, can I do this? If, if right. If Zen and I are talking today and Zen, you came up with a, maybe a great idea and said, Zen, I'm going to go away and do something with that. By next week, it'll be up and running if it makes sense, which is S-E-N-S-E -S -E versus sense. Now, I know a lot of people don't have that privilege. They've got to kind of follow the lead and kind of go down this hallway with walls. We don't have any walls, which allows us to say, we're going to start a production company. And next week, guess what? It's up and running. We're going to do consulting with uh, nonprofits or oh, and guess what? It's up and running. It goes back to walking the talk, but it's it's a privilege to be able to do those things. But it also says, my goodness, it goes back to choices. Now what do we do? And I love the fact that you've been able to uh, reach into that and pull out the treasures of mm -hmm. people from around the world and, and put them into this place that that's accessible um and the the fact that you know um that you support them well but we still wake up every day and my wife and i talk about it you know we'll get a new writer coming to us from somewhere and i look at them and say can you believe this person wants to write for us you know look at their credentials look at where they've been over over the years look at my goodness and it, it kind of wakes you up a little bit to say we're on to something here right uh, and i talked to a lot of these new writers from around the world so, you know help me understand how did you find us why us and you know what i hear a consistent theme and this has changed over the last year or so like everything else and they said well we heard a rumor that you allow us if i'm zen and i'm coming to write for you dennis I can roll up my sleeves. I can write about whatever I want, whenever I want, how often I want, and as many words as I want. It can be poetry. It can be the, 
So you give me the freedom to be a writer where I've written for other organizations where they say, Zen, it's got to be a minimum of a thousand words. You got to do it every two weeks. You're going to have six junior editors edit it first. And when we publish it, by the way, Zen, we're going to put all these little advertisements in, middle, in the middle. So it may not resemble what you wanted, but if you want to write for us. So writers are seeking freedom and connected to that over the last year is at a time where a lot of the writing freedom has kind of been squandered a little bit or squashed because certain words may be said that may be not be popular. And we're saying, look, we have one editorial policy. And uh, when it comes to that, uh, there is no such thing as censorship on it. As long as it's respectful and not mean spirited, we're going to publish it from every angle. So people say you're leaning left, you're leaning right. No, we're just leaning forward. Yeah, you can stay more focused because you've already gone, like you can trust your decision-making process. You've already gone through the decision. I chose this path because it was definitely the best path. So I'm going down this path and I'm going to be all in. If I'm all in, I'm not going to let distractions creep in there. And then also, like, I think this is in keeping with some of what you've already spoken about. You can do a vibrational attunement. You can stay vibrationally attuned to that path that you have chosen. There's a consciousness to that path. And that mm -hmm. consciousness can be interactive with you and bring you inspiration and in innovation, ideas, and all that stuff to make everything easier. That's just one optimization. So what's that vibrational attunement or attunement? Uh, how would you explain that to a left brain person? Oh, let's see. <laughs> could, it be a, could it be a sense? Could this it be a okay, feeling that once you've experienced it, it it's in the file, right? In, yeah. in your database. And so yeah. you can call that file up and, and be in that file. I think that is really accurate. That's a really good way of explaining it. And then also so many entrepreneurs already know about visualizing mm -hmm. and being, like you said earlier, the end state allowing that end state to be 360 degrees around you, all full senses, full senses, full sensory experience of fait accompli. I got there. I am completely successful. This is what's around me. And that is a form of vibrational attunement with all levels of your mind and consciousness on that path. And you go from that, I know you should do that a couple of times a day at least. And then your inspirations come from that. So your inspirations are on track and they're in tune. And, and so I think what's happening is that because of the internet, because of Zoom, the great benefit from, from all of this is not just working remote, but people being able to connect across the globe. Mm -hmm. And this is the key to uh, what, my, uh, what we're starting to call we set, the we set, the great we set. Now, right. as you know, and some maybe your viewers know, uh, the World Economic Forum, the WEF, which spelled backwards is F-E-W, which means few, a few people who have decided the destiny of the world and they have their money that they're going to perpetrate this on the rest of us. Not even necessarily malintent, but just seriously deficient in deep knowledge of what's really I, I totally agree with that. You know, we got his book. Uh, COVID-19, The Great Reset. Yeah. And he asked a, a couple of questions that really stood out in my mind. The first one was in regard to the people coming out of sequestration. And it was, can we be caring and, or, yeah, caring and compassionate toward each other coming out of COVID? That's a legitimate question. Very much so. Now, where his intention is with that, I'm not sure, um, based on the rollout of, of what You're they You're talking about the banker, uh, what's his name, uh, who wrote that book? Who wrote that book? Schwab. Okay. Yeah, he's the exact director. World Economic, yeah. Uh, so, and founder, yeah. And the second question that involves businesses is, is: Can we be agile? Right. So, you know, can we be flexible when we need to, and, and not be stuck in the old modes that are rigid and strict and, and have let, very little wiggle room in mm -hmm. them? Or can we look at okay, using this new sense making idea? right, of, you know, what works best and, and how do we need to, to move in that and how quickly can we respond to market changes mm -hmm. and new products and, you know, and, and making things that actually make the world a better place or recycle those things that have been diminishing the world in new ways. 
You know, and I think that it's really important. Um, you know, again, we've learned over the past several years that social media operates intentionally to feed people what they already believe mm -hmm. and then continue to uh, sell them stuff through fear. You cultivate fear of the other. And so consequently, both of these tribes have dehumanized one another. It, it's really shocking for me to see what um, progressives imagine Trump supporters to be like. And it's probably as, as uh, angry as an, and insulting as uh, what Rush Limbaugh used to say about liberals. But it's, but it's really the same thing. It's basically fear and separation, cultivating separation. And so as a white man once told me, fear is false evidence appearing real. What we that? seek to do, false evidence appearing real. What That's we seek to do, free every anxious reaction. And then, uh, of course, this is a mixed blood Cherokee that explained this to me. It was about 20 years my senior. And my response to that was, yeah, most of the time we just want to F everything and run. Exactly. That's the other, that's the other, uh, that's the other aspect of fear. Right. Uh, fight, flight, or, or freeze. And um, <clears throat> we're less intelligent, as Bruce Lipton would tell us, when we're, because what happens is all of our blood flows from the frontal cortex to our extremities. So uh, in a fear situation, we are, you know, we're very prepared to deal with, deal with a fire. We're not very prepared to creatively solve a problem. There's science that backs all of this up now. And the deeper we dive, the more questions we ask, the more intelligence we apply to it, then the greater rewards we get from it in the sense of being able to actualize it in our lives, right? I, I hope you're, you're right. I, I, you're I, doing I, it. You, I you hope... leapt off the cliff and you said, okay, I'm done with this world. There's something better. I need to make myself available, whether you thought this or not. But, I did. <laughs> right? Forgive so, me. So <laughs> now you stepped off that. And in order for the new to come, you had to let go of the old, right? Now, my, my dad used to say, you, it's easier to find a job when you have a job. Uh, right? Actually, it's true. I've lived my whole career that way. So, yes. Right. But, and, but I don't think that's true right now because I hope, my, my hope and my, my intent is to help move into the age of intuition. Right. It's not, it's not the age of empowerment. That doesn't sound right to me. But, you know, we've had the enlightenment. We've had reason. Well, first, first came reason, then the enlightenment, and then mass production. And, and now we're in this science where we, 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 we lean back on the language of science to make it real enough to be digestible. Mm -hmm. when, we, when we transcend through that, we don't have to say it's science and we can just say it just is. You and I were talking about that in our pre-meeting, that it just is and is is okay. Um, then we're, we're gonna be in this age of, of all three brains working together, I think. And the one, the brain that's suffering the most is the one that comes from our gut, that, that uh, mind, and it is spirit. You can't, damn it, you just can't not use metaphysical language. We just don't have good language to talk about intuition. So now that we're a global community, how do you see this kind of, uh, for lack of a better rhetoric, is, is that the appropriate use of the word? I think um, so. It's word searching. Right. How, how, does, how do you see that coming into play and maybe helping us evolve into something new? I, I, I don't have a good answer for that, but I, I have a, a suspicion, an intuition, if I may, okay. that um, two, two avenues to enlighten us, I hope. One is the, the learnings of positive psychology, the teachings or the research done in positive psychology, abundance thinking, and two, the great work being done in the complexity science realm. And you've used the word of, of emergence. If we can allow ourselves to become more comfortable with the currently ambiguous and open ourselves to interaction with the virgin ideas, it's more likely that innovation and creative output and good engagement and 
you know, happy workers, maybe, <laughs> um, can occur. Just I happy think. people in general. You know, we are uncomfortable with ambiguity, and that's where vulnerability steps so in. Creates fear. Right? And so there's this, you know, kind of a trifecta of faith, love, and trust that becomes present. And it's un and that's an uncomfortable place to be for most people because they're they're used to starts to get a little new agey again. Yeah. Um, but we're used to the the definitive solutions, you know, the, the being told. You know, Science. Like, Come right. down to the one. Right. Isolate the one. Or even religion. Or even religion. You know, there, there's a mediator, right? And there really isn't, right? <laughs> We've all got a direct connect. Like I said earlier, we're all cosmic consciousness condensed into form as a point of light. And that point of light bounces back and forth, depending on how well we learn how to use it. And interacts right. and has response and has call and has potential. Well, some of them, not all of them, but some sure. souls, when they're on the other side, see themselves as physical because they've brought a physical concept of a body with them, mm -hmm. ethereal. <clears throat> but then they wake up and say, wait a minute, this isn't me. And they see themselves as a speck of light. And then they realize that they're not human, that they are soul, that they are conscious. That point of light. Which is, yes, exactly. The right. soul, the spirit. And they also see these lights going in and out of this enormous light <clears throat> that everybody talks about the light. Mm -hmm. And they see these things and they be and they come to realize they are a part of the light. And the people who enter, not everybody that enters into the light, but many people who enter inside the light during their death experiences actually become creators and see themselves creating the universe and experiencing. So um, I recommend anybody to read um, Mellon Thomas Benedict's NTE because it's probably the most astounding of all the NDEs there are. Just mind-boggling. Beautiful, okay. beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, I've, um, I, I wrote up mine. Is it, uh, it was quite different. Most of them, uh, and I have yet to find those that have had uh, non-trauma related, right? Mm -hmm. uh, mine was simply, I prayed to know what truth was. I was willing to give up give my life mm -hmm. to know it mm -hmm. i was asked and i went yeah. and uh, you know i left my body looked at it laying across my dorm room bed i was living in uh, the honor storm at ball state university in muncie indiana at the time and i turned back to look where i was going and immediately engulfed by white light and i knew immediately because i was analyzing what was happening that i was thinking and so I knew at that point that, oh, there really is no death. Ah, and yeah. but it got boring because ah. it was with white light. And as a teenager, I was 18 years old, right? And so I was like, give me more. And so I questioned, is there more? And that's when I moved into this indigo background with points of light around me and was told that these are those that I'm to work with in order to help facilitate that new world. Mm -hmm. order. Mm -hmm. um, but it was specific in that everything will be there at its appointed time so uh, apparently there is a timetable of some yeah. sort and that we're all participating in it whether we realize it or not yeah. is that point of light whether we admit that it is within us or not every one of us have it and you know hopefully we'll get to that place where uh, and now i believe it, it's even more possible with how quantum physics is reflecting all of this from a science standpoint of what the you know ancient spiritual masters and, and right. the years and everybody's been you know loosely kind of trying to frame it because this is it's a it's a completely new area yeah right yeah. that yeah. we are um yeah uh, although spending the you at the speed of surrender <laughs> yes yes i like that i like that <clears throat> Um, scientists hate 
that us using their work in a spiritual men way. And yet it Some is Some have, but the others, you know, that, yeah. that too is shifting because they're realizing they can't argue with it. <laughs> you know, you can't argue with the truth. You can try, yeah. which is okay. a good thing because that even proves it further because the truth loves to be challenged. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree. I agree. Yeah. I love it. It's such a, it's so exciting. It, it um, really is. And I found that with my, because I was interested, I became interested in science in my mid-30s somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I'm in, I'm in my early 80s now. <clears throat> so um, that's a lot of years. And 40 odd. And Bless and your sort of, heart as an octogenarian. <laughs> and, I and call my, that being geriatrically gifted. They call us super agers. But really? you know what? I, I, I don't know if I agree with this concept of super agers because there are, I have a gang of friends that are all 65 and up. Uh -huh. and, and they are all bright, all of them can can you know with their memories are good they can sure. have a good discussion about things so i i think 80s is changing and 80s is the old 60s <laughs> and show respect now when i say show respect it's showing up when you show up to me that means coming early so we talked about that earlier um mm -hmm. now you know you you have a, a zoom meeting with somebody coming one to two minutes early if you have an interview 10 minutes Okay, so come early, come prepared. There is no way in today's world that you shouldn't spend at least five or 10 minutes Googling the person you're interviewing or interacting with before you talk to them so you're up to speed with who they're and what they do. And then here's the, here's the most interesting one, come with your heart. So this is, you talked about the three components before, it's come with your gut, it's allow your intuition to work and come with your heart. Now. This is shocking to me. I don't, I don't mention this as a stat. Only 50% of the people, when they walked into the, initially walked into the interview, show me their heart. Only 50%. So, so let me just think I'm about this. I, honestly, I'm surprised it was that high. Well, maybe part of what I do, <laughs> by the way, thank you for saying that. You're the first to say that, but I'll tell you, I'll tell you what I think it's why. When somebody would sign up for an interview, I sent them a 16-minute video on how to prepare. Ah. By the way, I always find that fascinating. I send a 16-minute video to prepare for a five-minute interview. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so by, but it by works, that, right? You give them oh, a, a, an honorable request and, and you show them, okay, here's some uh, opportunity to prepare so that you have the ability to be prepared first of all, and to know what to anticipate. And this is what I think a lot of people are, are afraid because they, they, they can't deal with the unknown, right? They want to know what to expect. And too often, you've got to throw your expectations out the window in order to be fully present and show your heart. Mm. Yes. Yeah, well, well said. And it, thank you. It's just really fascinating to me. So once again, I'm going to put it in a slightly different perspective. So you're being interviewed by the global credibility expert and you think without showing me who you are, only 50% of the people walked in the room wanting to show me who they were. Right? It's just, I, it, it always amazes me because once again, we're taught to be protective that we were hurt somebody before. So we don't want to, sure. we don't want to do stuff again. And I, you know, the only person you're hurting by not showing yourself. Questions is yourself. have a very disarming nature. Uh, they show respect. They show inclusiveness. I want to know what you think. I want to know how you feel. Um, and they also help us slow down a little bit with that exploitation. They help us um, not um, rush to judgment, which we so often do just arbitrarily out of anxiety. We want 
to figure things out. We want to know how our day is going to go. We want to know if this person is a threat or or what's behind that corner or what's going to happen next. And we can't lay out those maps about life right. in the world and where we go. And, question and one of the big things about sense making now, that, that, as I understand it, is the notion that we have to slow down in order to speed up. Hmm. That's something that I've been I've said for years, and it doesn't it doesn't initially make intuitive sense, but. If we want to increase our performance and our productivity, we have to slow down. That's what the slowing down is about. And questions lead, questions don't have to lead to immediate answers. They, the magic is when they lead to better and better questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Albert Einstein said, if he had an hour to make a decision, he would spend 59 minutes thinking of the question. Yeah. Now, what if, what do you think, or what have you noticed in your work? Because th this is obviously something that you've included and applied, at least in some areas, and, and with organizations, and had the ability to have that catbird seat, right, <laughs> uh, of uh, observation. How does that work? Yeah. How do we, I care about where the rubber meets the road, and most people do. You know, the practical application of the of the of the amazing things that we learn and that are shown to us by the universe. Um, I think one way that it works, one thing that I've come up with is um, the idea of suspending judgment until a decision has to be made. Keep the aperture open until you have to make a decision about something. Um, if you're going into a business meeting on a Monday morning, um, it would be nice if you could lay everything out in a nice package with a bow on top on a Friday afternoon. Uh, but, but why do that? Do you need to do that? Can you still have a good weekend and keep that, keep that open? Um, it's that success is when preparation meets opportunity kind of thing. The opportunity is not going to come until Monday. Um, you, you know, keep the door cracked open just Hit a little. Hit the pause quick. button. Let it Hit relax and percolate for, for a while, right? Yeah, you're an adult. We're adults. Keep the, um, have a little intestinal fortitude and courage and realize that you are not your brain, you're the owner of your brain. Tell your brain to settle down, calm down. We're going to, we're going to do, move the ball as far as we can on Friday afternoon. We're going to keep the door cracked open on anything that might be, anything that might happen, anyone that might rush in at 7.59 that, that spins your perspective, we're going to keep that open for possibilities of what might be. Uh, so suspend judgment until a decision has to be made. That's one, I think, core thing I've learned. <laughs> I can sit here and tell you to do that and then I'll make another, I'll do the exact opposite because I'm anxious and I want to well, get yeah, this settled. And, settled and therein I'm... is the crux of the matter, the anxiety, right? Yeah, the anxiety, the... energy, energy That's... that is, yeah. So, so in that case, cognitively, we're getting pulled around by our brain and, and some people don't even know it their entire lives. I like to think of your brain as a, as a faithful dog. Um, you need to love it. You need to feed it. You need to brush it. You need to let it off the leash to run mm -hmm. sometimes. Um, you need to keep it out of your neighbor's garbage. Don't let it get in fights with skunks. Um, you know, take care of take care of your brain. Keep it on a leash. Take care of it. Call it to um, help you when you need it. Yeah. At least but don't time. let it don't let it run your life. Right. And above and beyond that recognize and, and especially now with the studies of consciousness and, and quantum theory and, and all these kinds of things we realize that we're not just our brain that's the tool 
and that there really right. is just, and I'm going to use the term one mind that we have access to. Now that one mind is differentiated into all kinds of individuated, um, perfected form, fit and functions, right? Yeah. That that's part of that universal tapestry, if you will. And yet the, in that one mind, there is one energy and it is self-aligning in that thoughtmosphere of the one mind. Now in our inherent thoughtmosphere, because of the physicality, we've been structured in the bipolar notions, right? Yeah, we love by we love good, evil, those kinds of things. Bipolarity and right. And so picking a side. Now, how do you feel about the, the prospects of there really just being one energy and it's our choice of what direction we go with that, which is our brain function, not necessarily the mind that we're connected to in the larger scope, but we actually, it's the individuated choice that we have through our cognitive activity in the physical brain. I think if I understand you right, I think there is one energy. I think there is a river of consciousness that we can tap into, that we are attuned to. And if we can clear enough clutter out of the way, we can we can see that and ride. There's a lot of driftwood. And a lot of driftwood, and we can ride that. Yeah, we've river. got to be the leaders. We've got to show by example. You know, um, I like to I like to, you know, give to other people you know when i first communicate when i start any kind of conversation my first question or statement is how can i be of value to you because i know that there's something that i've got be it i've either got some insights from my you know life experiences i can guide them to resources or i can make a connection if i connect with them and i feel it's the right connection sure so i've always got something that i can make a positive difference so I think people like yourself, like myself, that are living it by example and helping people understand this is a better way. You know, yes, we all want the transactions. Transactions will happen ultimately if you show that you're of value and that you're empathetic. And that They're you're empty there. without the relationship yes. on a sensory level. Yes. You know, they're, they're void. And like... Um, T. Harv Eker says, you know, what you do anywhere, you do everywhere. So the patterns that you establish, whether you recognize it or not, you're going to be doing it everywhere. So one of the things, how did you first learn to observe yourself? Probably it started off by observing other people. You know, some of the lessons back to, and I took a look at because I was starting with the heart, you know, and the head. And mm -hmm. the more that you start realizing, because I took a look at my patterns, and yeah. what patterns continually would repeat themselves, and how I continually, unfortunately, would get myself burned. It's like, how many times do you put your hand on a hot stove before you realize, you know, and so you start shifting your consciousness in relationship to how you evaluate things, which you said it very elegantly in well, thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I have a little practice. <laughs> <laughs> so back to the, the, the process of observing, and, and it's important you that you mentioned the patterns. Okay, as a cognitive scientist, that's what they do, is they recognize the patterns of the brain, and that's really what they are, right? The behavior happens because of the pattern thinking. Now, when you're observing your th thoughts, how do you, uh, or how did you, because I'm sure you practiced this for a long time as well, how did you first recognize the stinking thinking? Well, one of the advantages that I happen to personally have, and I mentioned it to you earlier, I've been happily married for 37 years and my wife is brilliant. And mm. so I've got a sounding board and quite often she in a very loving way will point out when I've got st stinking thinking, you know, one way or sure. the other. Um, and that mirror is all important. Yes. Really. 
Totally. So th that definitely helps when you've got the right sounding board. But if you don't have the sounding board, you've just got to, you know, quite often, you know, I don't look at myself as ever procrastinating, but there's, you know, if I'm making a decision, I need at least 24 hours to self-evaluate whatever I might be thinking about if it's of significance. I mean, sometimes yeah, you think about it, it, dream about it. That's meditate. another activity that we don't take advantage of because we're, we don't know how. Yes. Right? Um, or I mean, some do, right? There's a lot of dream theory people out there. Mm -hmm. um, and that is an advantage when you are able to um, at least be cognizant of the dreams that you have and, and not be too caught up in thinking that there are um, in the moment thing because they're often you know reflective of multiple things in your life definitely you know paying attention yeah and again it's just becoming more conscious and aware mm -hmm. you know and the more you're in tune with you know your complete self the more that you're able to deal with the things that you've that are around you in consideration of this process we're in what might you offer as a personal advice in potentially global and specific um, way that our listeners could maybe explore this ability to change within themselves one of the pieces of advice one of my first direct mentors gave me because in my mind, I knew where I was and where I wanted to be, and I wanted to be there faster. So he would always say to me, attitude of gratitude. Be grateful for where you are as you're going to where you deserve to be. You know, we all deserve, I mean, obviously, no matter what we think, you know, we deserve to create the things that we truly think about, you know, in a positive, in a positive realm to have. Mm -hmm. but there's a process that we go through. And, and so you've got to enjoy the process. The attitude of gratitude was very instrumental. Well, do you think it's by design? I mean, do you think that there's a, this natural design within us that's on an evolutionary path, regardless of what we think about it? Interesting question. I never really thought about it, but, you know, when you look at history and everything that's going on today, um, you know, I think it's by necessity that we need to we need to shift that we need to come together if we're going to survive for the greater good of the, everything the thing i'm trying to come to is this this question of, of um ways of nurturing the kinds of change that many people are talking about if to the be the change you want to see in the world mm -hmm. you know and and you asked this question earlier of how you know how do you um how do you connect better with people and at some level it's it we do it by being ourselves and making it easier for others to be themselves too and then we discover the common bond even when we see some things really differently and we discover that um that it's by bringing these different perspectives together that we're going to actually co-create something that neither of us uh, none of us alone would have figured out Right. That's where the excitement comes in. And the synergy and the, happens. And the synergy and the letting go of the need to be the one or the hero or the whatever. It's all it's a facilitation, not, right? Well, yes and no in that even, you know, we struggle with language, right? The word facilitation has also been used for many, many years. And there's still this notion of we're trying to facilitate a certain outcome and there is a need to do some letting go and maybe there's other terms that i think that we've used like stewardship mm -hmm. um uh navigation um uh the sherpa the shepherding the you know all of those things I, that I agree with those and yet facilitation for me holds a special meaning because it is moving something or helping to move something forward yes um, and so when, when everyone can be a facilitator in that space, right, 
the the attention to what's happening internally and, and how it might affect the external and, and the the insights the ahas the possibilities the the new ideas that might move things forward because this is one of the things that, and i'm going to see if you kind of see this too when you're able to have those open conversations and every voice is is being heard or, or at least there's a willingness to hear it and that doesn't mean everybody's going to speak and yet even those that don't speak if the importance is intense enough somebody will say what's on their mind in the group mm -hmm. and i've seen that in, in multiple places but so in this process then um where considering that in this paradigm of structure that that we're kind of extricating ourselves from which is across the the board from industry to education and, and from society society to basic education that there's this um, lack of attention to the holistic system which includes mind body spirit and planet and now there's this new paradigm kind of this new model that's being built because we're tired of fighting the old one and realize that yeah we really can't do that anymore because all we're doing is feeding it energy when our attention may be better elsewhere and how do you see that aspect evolving in, in the work and, and play that you're active in? Well, I think, you know, much of the wisdom of, of Buckminster Fuller um, still holds a lot for us all because it's not simply a matter of saying, well, we're going to um, uh, ignore um the existing organizations and institutions, et right. cetera. But there is a growing critical mass of people from all of those sectors that in varying, through varying pathways, have become more aware and are more concerned about finding some new ways and are increasingly acknowledging that the current ways and the models are broken. Mm -hmm. And so it's working with- that's being called model. agile in the new- well, no, that's not oh. even new. I mean, there's those that are even having debates about agile, Agility. So yeah, different yeah. forms of agile. But no, I think, uh, I think, um, let me back up a little bit. Okay. We can have all kinds of conversations in different groups, and we can reach uh, a, a deeper sense of, of um, community and connectedness and bonding and all of that. But even there, what do so you generate what? from it, though? Hmm? What yes, do you that's generate the, that's from the point. That's <clears throat> the point. So even there, it's kind of so what? Because what happens is people leave and they go back to wherever their lives and whatever they're doing, and that beautiful energy dissipates, and after a while it fades, and people wonder if it was really real, and what do I do with that? And the biggest problems that we're seeing is in the follow-through of some form of implementation. <laughs>